right. Julian. There you go. Take. So, hello, everyone. So, my name is uh, William Butchwalter. I'm a senior software engineer at, uh, at Microsoft in the uh, AI and research group. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of context, I'm, I'm not going to talk about Azure mostly, um, just Kubernetes in general. And I've been working in the Kubernetes slash ML space for the past 18 months. Uh, I've actually been contributing to Kuflow since last July. It wasn't called Kuflow back then, but still, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So I just want to talk a little bit about why are we interesting in Kubernetes, interested sorry, in Kubernetes for machine learning in the first place, right? Kubernetes has been developed with microservices in mind, not GPU workloads or anything like that. So why does it make sense to use Kubernetes? Obviously, the, the biggest, the, the strongest point for Kubernetes is the community, right? This community is just amazing and, and so large that if you're a company wanting to do machine learning training, for example, and you want to deploy a new training strategy, something, let's say, like population-based training, it's actually kind of complicated to do, but you have a, a, a good chance of finding an open source implementation already working for you on Kubernetes. So obviously, this is a strong uh, argument. Um, but then, it's also because Kubernetes, I think, has really well-designed and clean APIs. So that means even if you don't find what you want and you need to start from scratch, it's actually much easier to do that on Kubernetes than it was just a few years ago. Uh, for example, I worked actually on population-based training, so which come from DeepMind originally, uh, with a, a large customer, and, and to implement that on Kubernetes, it just took a few days and, and an M-chart. It's actually really easy because the APIs are really nice. Um, and obviously, scaling is important. Kubernetes can scale pretty largely. Um, so, for example, we have a nice case study with OpenAI. So, a few months ago, I think in, in January, OpenAI released this blog post called Scaling Kubernetes to 2,500 Nodes. Um, so they did that on Azure, and you know, it, it wasn't easy. They had, they had a lot of issues with etcd, uh, network, disk IO, et cetera. But ultimately, they managed to reach that scale with a, with a very small team of, of engineers. I think there were two, maybe three people. Um, and, and a single job, in their case, can go up to 10K cores. So that's, that's pretty big. And this was, they finished this clutter like last year or two years ago. And with every single release of Kubernetes and etcd, it's becoming easier and easier to go even further than that. So I'm really excited to see where, where this is going. Uh, yeah, that's my Azure slide, I guess. Uh, so we, ha we have kind of two um, offering for Kubernetes on Azure. We have AKS, which is the full managed uh, Kubernetes, where you don't have to do, to do anything yourself. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have ACS Engine, which is open source, where you can really do whatever you want with it. So ACS Engine had support with for GPUs for quite a while, but AKS now has, uh, has GPU support officially. Uh, and we are releasing this week uh, a workshop, so kind of 10 module labs, to walk you through doing Kubeflow on Azure. Uh, so we're assuming no knowledge, starting from zero, starting from what is Docker. Because Kubeflow is nice, but we have to realize that a lot of people that want to use it don't know anything about containers and Kubernetes. And so we have to make an effort to onboard them, right? And I'm going to finish by, um, by just a, a few thoughts. So I'm not going to talk about everything here. Uh, but I want to talk about two things that I think are going to be interesting. So it's a bit far-fetched, uh, but the, the first one is virtual kubelet. So if you didn't hear about that, that's um, a project basically to do an open source implementation of the kubelet that you can then back up with usually something like Azure Container Instance or AWS Fargate. Uh, but for example, someone just made a request to add a provider for Azure Batch. So Azure Batch lets you run basically GPU jobs. And you might wonder why you want to do that instead of just using GPU and Kubernetes. The reason is because you can scale pretty, very fast in, in a matter of seconds with Azure Batch. And so, for example, it would be really nice uh, for use cases when you want to do transfer learning on very short uh, training times and when you want to keep control of the cost. Um, and another one which I'm excited about but is very early is MetaParticle. So if you were at KubeCon last year in Austin, you might have seen the keynote by Brendan Burns where basically made this point that Kubernetes is becoming the standard runtime of the cloud, right? Uh, and since it's a runtime, we also need a standard library to go with it. So you can directly from your code deploy to Kubernetes without having to go for Docker files and Kubernetes templates. And so, I'm, I mean, I'm playing with this idea of tailoring MetaParticle to work specifically for machine learning. So for example, you could define a decorators in Python on top of your function to say, okay, I want to train this function uh, using that many agents in parallel, et cetera. And when you do Python, my script, it's actually going to deploy everything, build everything, and deploy on the cloud for you. For example, using a Kubeflow CRD, something like that. Uh, so obviously, it's extremely experimental, uh, but you're know, just uh, sharing a few thoughts that I think are interesting. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you. 
All right.